Um, today I want to present three of my projects, recent projects, that focus around um, social networking, but I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm talking about the analog type of uh, social networks. Um, for me, a social network is when you, as an individual, um, find a safe place to actually leave your safety zone behind and in collaboration with others, you're able to uh, go in uncharted territory into something that you never did before and learn something new. So, as a visual artist, I try to instigate this kind of social networking ability that's in each of us. And I try to uh, render that visible in my projects. So, um, first though, I want to tell you a bit how I came to this um, current art practice that I'm doing. And that started with my family. Um, basically, my upbringing taught me that I um, have to get a grab on my creativity. No, I have to get um, take responsibility for the situation. I create the situation as a person. So you can see me and my sister, and my parents are out of the picture, and they're on purpose out of the picture, because they were very self-occupied with themselves. Um, their marriage ended in a divorce. And so my sister became my conspirator, became my collaborator, but also my rival, my competitor. She's very close age-wise to me. So, all right, that's another form of collaboration. Um, as a Swiss citizen, my age, at that time, I had to do mandatory military service for two years. Um, it's definitely uh, male bonding and um, a lot of camaraderie going on. The problem is um, that the cause was totally out of my control. The way I stayed sane um, and started reflecting and telling the story was using my camera. Uh, wherever I was able to photograph, I photographed and documented my experience, which was not a great one. After experiencing Cold War in Switzerland, I needed a break. I left Switzerland far away. I ended up in an inner city town in New Jersey. Uh, and um, I found myself being the pretty much only white guy in a rundown inner city. Um, the second month I moved in there, I did a social assignment for a church. So I was a social worker, did a social internship. Uh, my next door neighbor got killed. Um, he was a community activist. And so my boss, my minister told me, well, don't leave the house after 8 p.m. Well, I was 21 years old, you can't tell them. So um, I was lucky enough to find um, Gloria, this African-American woman, um, who suffers from MS, multiple sclerosis, and was bound to her wheelchair. And it was an interesting kind of uh, synergy there. Me being the only white guy, having no connection to this place, and meeting this woman, um, who is pretty much room locked. So what happened is we took walks. I took her around town, and I felt suddenly safe. I could be the white guy with the black woman, and nobody would bother me. All right, now fast forward uh, to Japan. Um, so I did a lot of photography work, and I met a guy, uh, a compatriot, who did research on landscape and gardens in Japan. And he asked me if I would do a photo project uh, in regard to a book that he wanted to publish. And it turned out into a quite long project. For two years, I was photographing all around. And what happened is I contested the public space. I found myself in these sacred temple gardens, but I wanted to take different photographs. So I ventured in, I was an intruder. And suddenly I found that what's happening behind the camera is much more important to me. It's about me, it's about my performance, my presence, that made these uh, close up, uh, out of the ordinary pictures possible. So I wanted to instigate more uh, this kind of performative aspect and about our roles that we take on in public space, because especially in Japan, public space is very categorized. We do commerce, we travel around, 
um, but uh, you don't really play in public space. So very seriously, I started to play. And for two months, I did useless activities, services. So for every weekday, one hour, a specific uh, activity. On Mondays, it was tea ceremony time. I did mobile tea ceremony for two months, every Monday, one hour, very serious, because I studied tea ceremony. Not everybody liked it, of course. I had problems. I had lots of uh, superficial encounters, uh, conversations, uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, situations and happenstance, as I call it. I documented everything. I had a lot of media attention. It was a really breakthrough as an artist. But um, I missed connections. I missed relationships. It was very short-lived. So I started to think, what could I do? Could I be smarter? Um, how can I deepen my relationships? I was lucky enough that a curator in Saigon invited me um, into a community art project in uh, southern Vietnam in a small town, a small uh, coffee-growing town. And then I was like, okay, there must be a way to work with people in more long term. So I was thinking of a game, a very simple game, where we would distribute um, single-use disposable cameras, and I set up rules that uh, my participants are supposed to take photographs six times a day, every other hour, and they are supposed to meet with us uh, on the weekends, once a week, and this project should go on for one week. I was very lucky that Fujifilm sponsored me and gave me 60 cameras I could use, including the prints. So we went around town, and um, this is my collaborator, Son. Um, he was my translator and my pilot, and uh, really he made this, this uh, project possible. It's this mountain town, uh, it's really stretched out, and we did a lot of miles on that bike. We were able to find 15 participants, very various participants that we met at the coffee shop, at the park, on the street. So we have a coffee shop owner, we have uh, tea farmers, we have security guards working for the coffee company, a grandmother, um, students, um, young mother, all kinds of very different people, and that was the aim. Because Vietnamese society is also quite segregated. Uh, we have people for, uh, belonging to an ethnic minority as well. So let's look at what the reaction was, what pictures were taken by these participants, and what they had to say. They were supposed to take notes. We are singing together in the tea plantation. I'm glad that Kotha, my neighbor, is taking care of my baby and the camera. This is the view from my workplace, the coffee plantation. You know, my hometown consists basically of coffee and tea. This is a 16-year-old boy, and he was actually led into the project by his sisters. All the sisters, they said, hey, this is a cool project for our little brother. He has a, he has a creative strain. Well, the problem is we didn't, uh, we didn't do the calculation with his father. His father came into the game, and he said, no, 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 you can't do this project. You must be spies. So we suddenly were confronted with history, political issues. That's his father, and he said, first I got suspicious that this project wants to spy on my family. Eventually I was convinced otherwise and had fun with the camera. So it took about two weeks to, to convince him that we're just really poor artists and just interested in meeting people and getting them empowered. And then eventually he took the camera himself and started shooting around among his co-workers and they had fun in the jungle. Good. Another uh, person participating. I like to take photos of my family and neighbors passing through our house. They're funny, beautiful, and part of my life. I didn't feel comfortable to bring the camera to school, so I broke the rule and photographed just around my house. My storefront on Highway 55 is a convenient viewing spot. All kinds of people come by at my gas and snack station. My camera was not always welcomed, but I tried anyway. My daughter is so cute that I took pictures of her all day long. Sorry, I couldn't resist. So here we had like a picture series. He took away, he took photographs, about 20 photographs in the park, Sunday afternoon, so he broke the rule. The project ended in a big installation, and this was the time when all these 15 participants, or I should say participating families, were meeting for the first time. So this is the time where people would get together. 
and they would select the photographs they wanted to show to the public. And this installation was laid out in a kind of a timeline where people would put down their photographs at um, uh, the time they were taking the photographs. So you could compare what person photographed at a certain time, what photograph. All right, next project, that's last year. Um, I participated in a competition for an artist residency in Sardinia and uh, my project has been accepted. So we're talking about a small town called Villa Sor in Sardinia, that's in Italy, in the Mediterranean. It's a small town and I looked at Google Earth and I saw like, oh, they have a cute little castle. Well, I haven't been to Europe in a while. Why not be a tourist? Why not be a super tourist and do a project where I do the same activities all over again? Okay, so I, I proclaimed I'm a tourist. And I brought with me some salt and palm leaves. They would be kind of the rite of passage. So while I do my walks in that city and do the same activities all over again, whenever I leave a door, whenever I go through passage, I leave some salt and some palm leaf uncommented. This was just meant to spread rumors. All right, so every day for four weeks, I would do the same thing. I would go to the kiosk and buy a postcard. Every day, I would go to the coffee bar and get an espresso. I would go to the post office and buy a 60 cent stamp. I would go to the piazza, the main square, and ask for directions to the castle. I would end up at the castle and ask for a guided tour. Every time I came back after these walks, and this walk, these walks lasted between one hour and three or four hours, depending on what happened in between, I would make a connection diary where I would uh, note down all the communication I had, all the people I met, and I had a kind of a scale, um, what kind of quality, what kind of chemistry, what empathy level that was happening between me and that person. Very rigorous. But as an artist, you have to uh, visualize what you're doing. So let's see what the response was. He insisted on buying a postcard exclusively from Villa Sor. I started worrying after a week when I ran out of options. On a rainy day, I suggested a card with lots of green. On a sunny day, with lots of blue. It made me consider the small things that make this town special. Now we go to the castle. I met four people every day at the castle. I gave Marcus the same castle tour in Italian about a dozen times. Crazy as it was, it made me a better communicator. Because of the language barrier, I had to engage on a much more personal level. Marcus is a terrorist. The information he acquires here seems to be erased at the end of each day. I wonder if Marcus is learning how to remember things again. I rose to the occasion and told him lesser known aspects of Sardinian culture and personal matters. For my part, I learned to accept the unknown. We didn't know what the salt piles meant, so we told the cleaning lady not to touch it. I liked how all of us had to pull off our creativity and became inventive. On some mornings when Marcus was late, we asked ourselves, where is he today? Why didn't he come yet? We started to worry. At the end of the four weeks, I made the ultimate guided tour myself with all the information, all the episodes I accumulated, invited all the people in the city. There was also an installation going on because I'm a visual artist, I have to produce an installation. So what I did, I took 50 kilograms of salt and lots of palm leaves and distributed among the people. I made a little story, a little fairy tale, and so the idea is people can pass it on. This is the third project I want to talk about, uh, which is in Korea, also last year. Um, I was invited to do an artistic research project here in this old Korean style market. That's in Anyang, that's a satellite town of Seoul. Um, and if you look at the photograph, you can see on the left, on the right, you can see these high rise buildings. This is Korea for you. Uh, so you have these high rise buildings, it's about urban development, urban challenges. And for like 15 years, on this spot in the middle where the market is, they plan a new high-rise apartment building, a huge, super complex. And because of that, this market is run down and about half the stores are vacant. So for me, as an artist, I had to task to look into ways to activate this space, to do something, because there's so much space. 
available, you can do something. So what I did, I, I did research on the food culture in that, in and around that market, and I discovered that we have about 40 establishments, various kind of food stores that are quite interesting. And so I was developing a concept uh, that I called the no menu restaurant. Very simple. The idea would be create a nice space, make a big table, and have people bring foods, foods they grow, foods they find, food they buy in the market, for example. And then have people negotiate the menu. There's no money involved. And at the end, people cook together. So the connection through food. All right. Now I needed a name because I wanted to use no menu, uh, the no menu restaurant, but somehow the, the art management didn't like that. It needed to be closer to people. All right, closer to people. Then I decided, okay, let's do a survey. Instead of just deciding it myself, I go around the market and ask the people about options for the name. So I made a list with these uh, 20 options and I went around each store. You can see the store owners. And they were delighted, they were excited. So first of all, the new, oh, okay, a new restaurant is coming, but it's kind of a restaurant where we have a voice as well. Well, there was exceptions. This woman on the top, uh, bottom left, she's just next door to the store I established. She was not really happy at all. Anyway, we ended up with that store name, Dancing Cooks. All right, and it was time to renovate that store. And in, within three weeks, we made it into a nice store. This is my collaborator, cooking collaborator, Hansam. What we did is we collected old wood from gallery shows and from around the city and recycled wood and made furniture. We recycled brick stones that we found. We made the pizza oven because I wanted to have a, a cuisine, a kitchen that offers Western and um, Korean food. And for Western food, you need a good oven, which was impossible to find and finance. So we ended up having this place. So that was this uh, restaurant, Dancing Cooks. Um, which turned into kind of a little social hub in a back alley of that market. And every day was something happened. So at 11 in the morning, I would open the store and I would never know what was happening. This is from the inside. So basically, super small store, what we're basically going to have is a very large table with built-in oven. So the idea is people come, lay out food, we talk, we drink. It's all happening around that table. This is the food guide I made before. So for newcomers, and many people came from all around Korea because it's quite a well-known art program. So we had like uh, curators and art directors coming. So they could orient themselves and find places they could buy food. So everybody could participate in a, in a quite fast way. And so the only thing I would do is every day I would make pizza dough because pizza is fast to do. And in Korea, everything goes really, really fast. Sometimes people want to eat fast. And pizza you can make within 20 minutes. So here, let's see what happened. Can you turn my leftover veggies into a pizza? This is the next door store or store owner. Can you also grill meat in your pizza oven? Korea, meat country. Usually I go with my mom to the supermarket. I've never been to this kind of market. I didn't feel like cooking alone tonight, so I came down here to join this fun group. I wanted to learn how to make pizza dough and found lots of support in this open kitchen. I wanted to teach Marcus how to cook Korean food and make japchae noodles. Can you bake pizza with natto? I'm pretty new to this kind of cooking improv. We got off early from school and didn't feel like going home straight away. They stuck around for three hours, had to throw them out. <laughs> this is the first time I'm making pizza. I never expected to sit and eat together with so many different people. Today was Korean Thanksgiving, and nobody was at Dancing Cooks. But we found the door open and decided to have a romantic family dinner here. I'm sending you the pictures I took. <laughs> this is the first time in my life that my wife lets me actually cook food. I heard that this kitchen promotes local food, so today I shared my homegrown lotus leaf pancakes on fermented coffee sauce. I felt great, it felt great to be the owner and chef of this restaurant for one night. Some of the customers might, uh, might eat at Dancing Cooks instead of my own eatery, but I don't mind that since more social activity at Soksu Market benefits us all. This is the director of this whole art program. He writes on this chart calls, Marcus and Handsome are terrorists. 
it comes back again. Okay. I have a, uh, a stop motion animation here where you can see what happened at one evening. You can see that we're using tiles, bathroom tiles as plates. Um, the glass jars are all recycled from glass recycling that you could find around the town. The red circles with the numbers in it indicate is a possibility. It was a, an extension of the project where we could do local food days. So um, people would bring, try to bring food that is grown as close as possible to the restaurant. And so that's why we have the biggest circle for the closest, the five, indicating five kilometers. So, yeah, that's about it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.